Thank you for that introduction, uh, Rose. I really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to share this information uh, with you guys. And so, um, yeah, I don't need to say anything else, you know, uh, like, but like she said, I do work for Cherokee Nation. I'm the Special Projects Officer for Cherokee Nation Community and Cultural Outreach. And this is what I do. I do a lot of trainings. And so, you know, when we think about what do we want to pass on to the next generation? Of course, I'm sure many of you know, a lot of native teachings and Cherokee teachings, they've been passed down orally throughout the years. And so, uh, you know, our, our culture is something we definitely want to continue to perpetuate. And, but for what reason? You know, um, you know I think that um, is kind of gets lost, you know, um, on a lot of people. You know, what is the purpose of even uh, connecting youth with their culture or, or, you know, having them connect with these teachings? And for Cherokee people, it is because our culture actually provided a framework to live a fulfilled life of wellness. Everything we needed to live well and live balanced, we, we could find that in our culture. And unfortunately, when um, you know, we began to assimilate and you know, we, of course, were subjected to boarding schools, um, a lot of horrific policies were aimed at us to separate us from that culture, we lost a lot of those coping skills that were found in our daily living. And so what the Walking in Balance program aims to do is reconnect us to those uh, cultural values and um, you know, those teachings that help us to cope in a positive way uh, with whatever we face in life, right? And I'm, I'm sure you, know, you guys are all aware of the importance of you know, having positive coping skills, having a positive support uh, network, uh, you know, and so that's what we're talking about here. And I'm really, like I said, I'm really excited to share this. You know, I initially, I started this program for myself. I am in recovery. I have been um, sober for 10 years now. And so, you know, I began looking at our um, ceremonial teachings as a way for me to live a well and balanced life. I grew up traditionally. Uh, I was raised with all, the, all of these teachings, but you know, it really doesn't matter what you know if you don't practice these things, right? And so, you know, I, of course, you know, wanted to do other things. Uh, you know, who wants to talk about gratitude every day when you can go run around with your friends and be crazy and, you know, do some of these other things. And so, you know, I began to view them as less important. Unfortunately, what that did was it really disconnected me from my spirit. When I was young, I knew what my spiritual calling was from a very young age. I wanted to help people, uh, you know, but I was raised in a lot of trauma. There was a lot of um, chaos in my life. And so, you know, you were expected to be tough. That was the thing back then. You know, even my parents, you know, were, you have to be tough. And I didn't want to be tough. I wanted to help people. I knew from an early age, this is what I wanted to do. But I, I got away from that spiritual calling. And I instead, I did what other people, what I thought other people expected of me. Um, and, you know, it was more important to have the acceptance of other people than to follow, you know, my true spiritual calling, which is really, I just wanted to help people. You know, I've grown up and I've known trauma. And so I wanted to, you know, make sure I felt like it was my life's calling to help others who have experienced trauma. And so, you know, now that I am, you know, able to, um, you know, be at one with my spirit by following these teachings, um, you know, I live a fulfilled life of wellness. Of course, I have bad days, but, you know, I have bad moments rather. I don't really have bad days anymore because I, uh, these teachings enable me to practice mindfulness, practice gratitude. And, you know, if I have a bad morning, um, I don't carry that through the rest of the day now. And so, you know, when people look at native culture, they may see dancing and feathers and, 
hear our languages and our beautiful songs and some of the ceremonies that we practice, but they don't really understand the purpose behind them. And that's what I would like to kind of clarify with today's training, uh, what, what each of these things mean, um, and especially for our Native youth. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Like I said, um, you know, I really appreciate all of you guys joining me today. And so let me go ahead and share my screen and we can go ahead and get started really quick. So you can see here, this is what um, the, um, the walking in balance, you know, is really about. And so um, there we go. So, you know, in the past, Cherokee people, and not just Cherokee people, but, you know, really this is universal um, practiced values um, among Native people. And so, you know, but, you know, we practiced many positive coping skills that enabled us to walk in balance. And walking in balance, essentially, it means that we find a harmony between our mind, body, and spirit so that we can live well. And, you know, these are maybe seen now as kind of progressive ideas, right? When I was growing up, wellness and mindfulness and self-care, none of these things were mentioned the entire time I was in school. Not once do I remember hearing about taking care of yourself or your emotional wellness or anything like that. And so I'm really happy now that it's being discussed more in mainstream society. Um, people are starting to understand the importance of practicing positive coping skills, uh, focusing on your wellness. And so I'm really happy about that. And so, but Native people have, we understood, you know, since really time immemorial, the importance of uh, practicing these things. And so I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, that the times are kind of catching up. So, so, you know, like I said, you know, we have ceremonies that we practice in Cherokee culture, in Sioux culture, um, in Klamath culture, um, you know, and, um, you know, these native, you know, ways of doing things, we each have our own language, we each have our own ceremonies that are different, but we're really practicing the same things. These are actually the Cherokee cultural or native cultural teachings. Like I said, they're, they're really universal. Gratitude, mindfulness, self-compassion, self-care, wellness, sobriety, communication, respect, perseverance, service, balance, and action. When I looked back through all of um, the ceremonial teachings, spiritual teachings, and Cherokee cultural teachings that I was raised with, these are the ones that really called out to me. And like I said, we have a ceremony, you know, um, for each of these. We have, um, you know, each of these are passed down in, through different ways in our culture. And so whenever, you know, people look at Native culture, they may look at you know, and see that we are, you know, doing a stomp dance. What we're actually doing for that dance, what that dance is for, is for us to practice forgiveness. Um, we go just to the stomp ground once a month, and we actually go every Sunday to play stickball, but we will dance once a month. And I remember whenever I was young, my uncle Jim Mankiller, uh, Jigesa, we say Jigesa because he recently passed away. And um, so, um, but he, um, one of the things he taught me, I was little, he pointed at the posts that marked the entrance to the stump ground. And he said, you see those posts there? He said, once you pass those posts, you no longer have enemies. All of your resentment, your fear, your anger, um, you have to leave it outside of those posts. He said, um, you know, inside these grounds, these grounds are doctored. Uh, you know, and it's a spiritual place. And so um, I began to do that whenever I was young. I would just kind of mentally leave everything there. You know, I grew up, um, you know, poor. I grew up, you know, with uh, low self-esteem, not much self-confidence. And I remember being at the stomp ground is the place where I really felt free. I really felt connected to my spirit. I felt connected to everyone around me. And um, I was just okay being me. And that was an awesome feeling. And that was really the first time I knew what walking in balance meant. 
And so, you know, and one of the ways that we practice that there is we practice forgiveness on a regular basis. We've always understood, um, you know, the kind of toxicity of carrying around resentment and how it really just can eat you up from the inside. And so, uh, you know, we actually, you know, we have a ceremony for that. Um, you know, so these traditional teachings come from our ceremonies, our spirituality, when we gather or make medicine, you know, these values were taught through that um, activity as well. Even when we play our games, there are a lot of lessons, um, you know, that are passed along that way. Learning and speaking our languages, there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of our teachings, the context is really carried within our native language. So, you know, I encourage our youth, just one word a day, one word a day, and you are perpetuating your native language, um, you know, and so that is something to, you know, to be proud of. And so, you know, we are very um, blessed to have um, the technology that we have now, and you can find language resources really probably on every tribal website. And if not, you can find contact information for them. And so um, our art also, there are a lot of lessons, you know, that's a great way for, that's how we've really um, practiced mindfulness a lot is through our art, our storytelling. You know, I used to think it was funny because I was raised in Cherokee culture, but then I went to school, right? I spent most of my day in American culture. And so, uh, you know, whenever I'd go back home or if I'd have a hard time and I needed advice from an elder, I, I remember, you know, hey, can you give me some advice on this? And they would always tell me a story. And so, you know, instead of saying, oh, this is what you need to do. And, you know, you kind of go out the door. You would sit down and you have to wait for about 20 minutes for an elder to tell you this story to convey, you know, whatever value, you know, that they want you to to be aware of and to practice. And, uh, but it's, it's really awesome, you know, because uh, it makes it entertaining. It makes it memorable. And it's a great way for us to continue to, to perpetuate these values. Hunting and gathering, that is another way that, you know, we would practice gratitude. There are actually, um, you know, ceremonial practices that go with our hunting and gathering. Um, you know, we would say prayers, we would give thanks for whatever we're harvesting, whether it's an animal or a plant. And then we were always encouraged to leave something behind. Uh, you know, whenever I go, even if I just go and I'm gonna take some clippings of cedar, you know, for my home, I, I will leave something behind. Maybe I'll water the tree or, um, you know, do something. And that just, you know, that act really is just symbolic of us, you know, being grateful for what we are able to harvest. Our relationships also, there are, is, are so many um, teachings behind, you know, Cherokee relationships. Um, you know, one thing I think that's interesting is we are a matri matrilineal tribe, but we are also really matriarchal. Um, you know, our tribe, uh, whenever you got married, you would move in with your wife's family. Um, your clanship, uh, you know, your family is kind of passed down through your mother's side instead of your father's. Um, I know in Western culture, you take your father's last name, as did I, you know, but a, a long time ago, you know, things were practiced differently. And I felt like, you know, it really um, promoted balance within our, um, within our tribe, our village, and our culture. Um, you know, our leadership was comprised of 50% women. And, uh, you know, I felt like that really helped us to maintain balance. Uh, you know, it, if we look around our world right now, it, we are kind of out of balance, right? You know, um, and so, you know, that's one thing that I promote, you know, to our young women is to, you know, really seek out these and don't do not, you know, um, back away from these opportunities to rise to leadership. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it really takes all of us, you know, to, to provide that balance um, within our country. And so, you know, we have always, my aunt actually was the chief of our tribe uh, for 10 years. Her name was Wilma Mankiller. And, um, you know, so we have a long history of having female leadership and, you know, having um, a lot of things, like I said, 
uh, you know, really uh, were, you know, kind of passed down through the mother's side of your family. Um, you were often closer to your mother's brothers than you were to your own father. Uh, you know, and there were several reasons for this. If your father passed away in battle or for sickness or illness, your mom usually had a, a few brothers, you know, and so if your father passed away, you know, um, your, your mom's brothers were, were there to guide you. And that was actually, that happened in my case. Uh, it was my mom's, my uncles on, on my mother's side that helped me with my cultural teachings uh, when my father wasn't around. And so there's a lot of different, you know, ways that we perpetuate these teachings. And if these teachings are followed, we will live a fulfilled life of wellness and be able to walk in balance. So, you know, when we're talking to our youth and, you know, deciding, you know, how should we perpetuate these things or what should we be teaching our youth, especially now in the age of social media, where their influence um, is kind of, you know, just right there, right? You know, you're always on your phone a lot, especially our teenagers. And, you know, they're exposed to a lot of toxicity, um, you know, a lot of, you know, things that can take an emotional toll. So it, it is really important for us to continue to perpetuate and, and pass down these values. So, um, like I said, these components, they're derived from Cherokee cultural teachings. But these are not exclusive to Cherokee people. I've traveled to many different reservations. Um, I lived on the Klamath Reservation in Oregon. Um, I lived on reservations in Southern California, Northern California. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot. And one thing I've noticed about Native people, we all really believe in the same thing. We may practice these things, um, you know, a little differently, but our values are, are really similar. So and, you know, though it may look like a lot of information to take in at once, this program is actually pretty simple, and it involves very small changes to your daily living. So the first um, component of Walking in Balance we're going to talk about is gratitude. And you can see there it's written in our syllabary. Uh, Cherokee people, we actually have our own syllabary that was created by Sequoia um, in the 1800s. And so... Um, you very so I include that um, also on a lot of my teachings, and then you can see how gratitude is, um, you know, um, the Cherokee word for uhilesti. Um, that is the Cherokee word for gratitude. So, what we aspire to when it comes to gratitude, we aspire to live in gratitude and practice it daily. So, for you know, Cherokee people, gratitude really is the the bedrock of our culture being grateful every day. That's really the first tool that we have in our toolkit uh, to combat anxiety, to combat stress, uh, you know. And so, uh, you know, like I said, it really lies at the center of our culture. Um, and Cherokee people are taught that gratitude, it's a spiritual practice. So, I'm, you know, of course, I'm grateful if somebody gives me something. But what about the days when I get cut off in traffic and some guy calls me names. And, you know, what about the days I have a flat tire and the days my, my son is bullied at school and the days, uh, you know, my boss, uh, you know, we have, have a disagreement. What about those days? Should I be grateful on those days? And, you know, of course the answer is yes. The goal is, you know, to live in spiritual gratitude is to be grateful no matter what. Be grateful when I am ill. Be grateful when I lose a loved one. Be grateful, um, you know, no matter what is going on. And this coping skill has really helped me, um, you know, through, uh, you know, navigate some really difficult situations. Like I said, I recently lost my uncle. And instead of focusing on that loss, you know, my gratitude practice um, had me focusing on um, all of the funny stories he used to tell me. He's had such a great sense of humor. All of the, this actually, this entire program, um, it was the teachings, the, a lot of the teachings he passed down to me. And so I'm grateful for that. And so, you know, this is just a great coping skill. And so these are the things I want our native youth to get back to. Yes, it's not popular. Yes, you know, everybody isn't doing it. Um, it won't get you many likes on, you know, social media, 
But this is what helps us to cope in a positive way so that we can avoid, um, you know, some of the negative things we can fall into, like substance abuse, um, emotional eating, gambling, uh, risky behavior, you know, those are, you know, negative ways people are coping, right? But they just want to feel better. You know, this isn't very complicated, right? Why do people use drugs and alcohol? They don't feel very good, right? Maybe they've experienced trauma. Maybe they don't have any coping skills. And so, you know, by us teaching these traditional ways of coping, these traditional values, I really feel like it's going to, um, you know, help our youth, um, you know, um, as, as they, um, you know, journey through life. So, like I said, gratitude is woven into traditional Cherokee culture because we've long recognized the benefits of practicing it. So how do you practice gratitude? Um, I do it through prayer. First thing I do when I, I wake up in the morning, um, I just say a quick prayer. You know, thank you, creator, for another day. I'm so thankful for this day, this opportunity to wake up, to be of service, to be with my family. Um, and that's my quick prayer whenever I get up in the morning. Um, sometimes maybe I'll pray for my children or family members if they're, um, if I know that they're going through something. The next thing I do is a gratitude list. I do this every single day. When I get into the shower, I just start listing things I'm grateful for. Um, and it's funny that I do a lot of these activities. They really kind of um, take place when I am connected to water. And for Cherokee people, we've always, you know, water has been a part of a lot of our ceremonies. We actually have a ceremony called going to water where we go to water. Um, there are songs that we sing. Uh, we we um, kind of wash off in the, in this water. Um, it has to be flowing water, um, but it could be any water really. It's just symbolizes it's just the act of washing off and renewing. Right. And so what we do there, when we go to water, we forgive, we practice positive thinking. Um, we kind of are manifesting positive results for ourselves. And so uh, that is another really great coping skill. So I do this um, every day when I'm in the shower and um, it's not really organized. I just, whatever comes to my head, um, you know, I, so that just really helps me to focus. Instead of focusing on my son and daughter are already arguing um, in the other room, I can hear them. My dog um, used the bathroom. Um, in the hallway. Um, my spouse is grouchy this morning because she can't find her keys. You know, instead of focusing on that really stressful way to start the day, I start just by focusing on, oh, I'm grateful for this hot shower. I am grateful that I get to um, teach a really awesome class today. I am grateful that my brother is working on getting sober I am grateful that um, my cousin was released from the hospital. You know, whatever it, that is for you, it's really personal. I don't really share this with anybody. It's just for me. And like I said, it really just um, helps me to focus on my blessings rather than um, my challenges. Another one's take a gratitude picture. Uh, there is a program called Gratitude 365 <clears throat> where this lady took... Um, a picture every day for a year. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do this a lot and it's just really easy. Sometimes I'll post them so you can get that memory a year from now, right? That's another easy way to practice gratitude. Um, at your mealtime, having family list one thing they're grateful for. This is a great way to get the whole family to practice gratitude. You may get some silly answers from your kids, like, oh, I'm grateful that uh, my brother's feet don't smell too bad today or something, you know, but um, sometimes you may get, you know, kind of, um, you know, and a picture of, of what your kids are going through that day. And so, and then the last one, it's extremely important in Cherokee culture to let others know that you are grateful for them. This is another way that we practice gratitude. Be, and I, um, we feel like this promotes balance in our, our households. So a long time ago, um, every member of the household was expected to contribute to the household, right? And so nowadays, though, I really feel like, you know, it's kind of left up to the parents, you know, and they're like, well, why is mom always in a bad mood? Well, mom may be in a bad mood because she got you ready this morning, made your breakfast, 
went to work, had a rough day at work, had a rough day in traffic on the way home, came home, had to clean, had to cook, and then clean after cooking, and then put you to bed and maybe have 15 minutes um, for her to watch a show before she falls asleep exhausted, right? Um, that may be why mom is a little grouchy, you know? And so, you know, one thing I promote, you know, I really um, encourage with our youth is to let others know that, you know, you are grateful for them, but and also be of service in your household and in your community. And we'll talk about service a little bit later. So if you guys could put in the chat, what are you grateful for today? Um, if you guys have anything that you are grateful for, uh, you know, we can just go ahead and start practicing gratitude right off the bat. So um, thank you guys. Like I said, you know, I'm grateful to be here um, with you and to be able to share this, um, these teachings. So the next one we're going to talk about is mindfulness. Uh, you know, we aspire to be present in this moment without judging ourselves or others. Uh, you know, Cherokee people have always, uh, you know, practiced mindfulness as a way to be, stay connected to their spirit, the creator, and the environment. Uh, you know, I was taught that it's important to be present in the moment and not be always looking too much into the future or the past. This helps me keep my stress level down because I'm not always concerned with tomorrow or yesterday, but instead I just focus on living this moment and this day well. It is good to put your phone away sometimes and just be quiet. Take a walk and breathe the fresh air and reconnect with your spirit without your mind obsessing over the past or things to come. This is something I continue to work on, being present for my family. Not worrying about work, not worrying about yesterday, not worrying about all of these things. And I'm actually able, you know, this actually helps me in my presentation now. You know, a lot of times I would be here talking to you worried about home, worried about thinking about, I hope my wife's okay, you know, um, with the kids and I hope everything and all this, instead of being here with you, you know, I really feel like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. This is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, just accepting that and being happy that, you know, with my place here, um, this allows us to be present and it's a really great coping skill. So we'll check the chat really quick. And so um, Kristen said, um, she's, I am grateful that my foster daughter is home from college for the summer. That is awesome. That is a really great thing to be, um, uh, grateful for. Jessica said, grateful. Our family is together today. That is awesome. John said, um, I'm grateful for a community that knows me, knows my needs and cares for me. Awesome, guys. Thank you guys so much um, for sharing what you're grateful for today. I really appreciate that. And so, like I said, we, you know, the purpose of mindfulness is, you know, for us to be able to be present. You know, I've suffered from anxiety a lot of my life. That stems from childhood trauma. And so, you know, this is something that I live with. But practicing mindfulness really helps me to cope. And, um, you know, really helps me to, uh, you know, not to, to be able to keep my stress level down and my anxiety level down and to enjoy myself more. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, I kind of, it really hit me uh, when I turned 40 years old. I was like, this is a big milestone. I really need to kind of check in with myself and, you know, see, um, you know, I thought it was uh, important to kind of take stock of where I was at. So, I looked back on my life and I realized I hadn't enjoyed much of it. I hadn't, even during the best times of my life, which is coaching my kids, as, you know, um, sports teams. I love that. I was worried, you know, even during those awesome times, um, anxiety and fear ruled the day. I was worried about work. I was worried about bills. I was worried, is there enough food for the team? I was worried about, is it too hot out here for the team? I was just worried, 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 worried. And so for me, practicing mindfulness um, really helps me to um, cope with that anxiety. Help, like I said, helps me to be present and helps me to not have um, so many of those, um, you know, um, anxiety symptoms. And really, it helps me to keep my stress down, which, of course, is important for our physical health as well. You know, a lot of these negative feelings, um, 
you know, present themselves, you know, through, you know, physical symptoms, right? Increased blood pressure, um, you know, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes, not sleeping well, you know, all of these things can contribute to, um, you know, and, and have um, effects on our physical health. So it is very important to practice mindfulness. Um, and then, so, so here are some ways that I practice mindfulness. So, like I said, I mentioned that this is how some of the things that I do. The awesome thing about the Walking and Balance program is you can tailor it to fit your individual lifestyle, um, you know, and, and what you guys want to do as a family. As long as we're perpetuating these negative teachings, I feel like how we do it, uh, you know, it really benefits the family if you do it in a way that fits into your lifestyle, like I said, and maybe, you know, things that you enjoy doing. Because if you don't enjoy doing something, you're probably not going to stick with it, right? And so, um, you know, that's why I really love about the programs. You can really personalize them. So um, what is your happy place? So when, when thinking about mindfulness, you know, we think about, oh, I really just practice it sometimes. I'll close my eyes. I'll take some deep breaths. That is one great way to practice mindfulness. I just focus on my breathing, focus on breathing in and out. Uh, that really helps me to kind of recenter and get back to, to here. Instead of, like I said, I'm worried about work or I'm worried about all of these things. And that literally takes two minutes. So I'll do that sometimes. I do prayer. I do meditation. I'll take a mindfulness walk. Um, that would really helps me. I love being outside in nature. I love feeling the wind on my face, um, the sun on my face. Maybe the sun, not so much for you in Oregon. Uh, maybe you feel the rain on your face a lot, but you know, just being out there in nature, I really feel connected to my spirit. I feel connected to the environment and it just helps me to, uh, you know, really practice mindfulness. Mindfulness crafting is another one also. Cherokee people are taught that, you know, if we're making something, our energy goes into that. You know, the saying made with the love, right? You can tell um, whether mom wants to cook for you or mom really doesn't feel like cooking for you. The food actually tastes different. Like you, you know, you really, what you, how you are feeling, we're energy, right? So our energy is kind of transferred and can, can go into some of these things. So, you know, we, we um, I teach mindfulness crafting and we do native crafts. We make baskets, pottery, uh, blowgun darts, um, bows, arrows, all kinds of things. But we also do, um, you know, we do crystal cups. That's like a new thing now. We make magnets. We um, um, do sewing. We sew stuffed animals. So there are so many different ways to teach youth how to be creative and practice mindfulness that way. You know, um, and, and that's a great coping skill for them because, you know, if they're having a bad day, they can just kind of be creative, make something, right? And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here with walking in balance, it's not just if you're having a bad day, but it could be used, you know, as prevention. You know, if we're, that's really the idea is where if we're practicing all of these things, then we don't end up in the emergency room with high blood pressure, with panic attacks, with, you know, a lot of these negative um, consequences. So this is really about prevention uh, more than anything. Like I said, just take two minutes, close your eyes. <sighs> Focus on your breathing, you know, um, just kind of let, but I just let my thoughts kind of, you know, go. I don't really, uh, you know, I'm not really judgmental. Um, you know, I just kind of focus on my body and my sensations, focus on where I can feel my breath coming in and coming out. Um, and it, that brings me from out there to in here. And so, like I said, there are traditional ways we've practiced all of these things, but not everybody lives right near the reservation where you can go and practice, you know, some of these traditional things. So um, I think it's important, you know, Cherokees really believe in being flexible and being able to adapt. And so, you know, that's why I think that native tribes have always been so successful. We've never really, um, you know, hung on to saying this is the way, 
um, we understood a long time ago that we are going to continue to change as times continue to change. That's how we've been able to survive this whole time. And so, um, you know, like I said, you guys can practice mindfulness in your own way. So like I said, so what is your happy place? You want to throw it in the chat. When you close your eyes, if you picture fulfillment, what does that look like? You know, and that could kind of be our destination when we want to take a break, take two minutes, focus on our breathing, just kind of picture that happy place. Um, you know, that really helps me. So, um, you know, we also practice patience by accepting the present. Accepting, acceptance is a huge, um, is a great coping skill. You know, um, instead of, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish all of these things, I wish things would happen faster. You know, um, practicing that patience really helps us to, um, you know, keep our frustration level down. And then the last one, I encourage our youth to take a break from social media. Um, you know, this is um, very toxic. You know, I like cat videos, dog videos, but, you know, it can take a toll on your spirit, on your emotional wellness and your mental wellness. Uh, you know, because as soon as I get on my Facebook, literally, a lot of times the first five posts, please pray for my cousin. She's got COVID. Please pray for my sister. She's, um, she, she has cancer. Please pray for it. And I love doing that, right? I love praying for people, but that's a lot. You know, just a lot of that, you know, kind of stuff can really take a toll on you. So being mindful of what we're consuming, I think is also important. The next one we're talking about is self-compassion. Um, you know, we aspire to forgive, accept, and love ourselves unconditionally. Um, so I'm going to start moving a little faster through these, uh, you know, and but, uh, you know, in the future, we have workbooks also. And um, so that we could send out as a training aid. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I said, I'm going to move a little faster through these things. I realize your time is valuable. And so um, I want to make sure we're able to get everything covered in the allotted time. So um, let's see here. Thank you, Sue. Um, Sue says, I'm grateful for um, my extended family. That is awesome. So self-compassion. We aspire to forgive, accept, and love ourselves unconditionally. I came to learn about self-compassion through traditional teachings that stress the importance of treating ourselves in a good way. This is a skill that can be learned, however, it must also be practiced. So, you know, we can know these things, but, you know, it doesn't really matter if we don't practice them, right? So, you know, in American culture, Western culture, I feel like it's really promoted, um, you know, um, the, the, the idea of you should really be hard on yourself, push yourself, right? But this can kind of push you to be overly critical, judgmental, and less patient with yourself. So now I try to make sure I show compassion to myself every day and treat myself as I would a family member or best friend. So how are you? Are, are you good at forgiving yourself, accepting yourself, and loving yourself unconditionally? Um, you know, of course, we're not perfect. The goal of this program is not for us to be perfect, but to make a little progress every day you know, to be, um, to feel a little better, um, you know, um, I think is a huge thing, um, to accept ourselves a little more, accept our bodies as we're getting older, the weight doesn't seem to come off as easy as it did whenever you're younger, right? Except that you're getting gray hair, except that your hair is thinning, except, you know, whatever this is about myself, I want to accept myself and love myself no matter where, no matter what. And I want to diver, derive my self-worth, not from my job, not from how much money I make, not from who I'm with, not from the things that I have, but from the person that I am. You know, that's what we really promote is, you know, having that self-worth come from, um, come from inside us and come from, you know, like I said, the, the person that we are, not from how we look or what we have, um, because those things change. What if you lose your job? You know, would if you lose your money, would if, of course, your looks, they're going to change. Um, you know, we are going to gain weight, you're going to lose weight, all of these things. 
Um, you know, and as we go through that process, we don't want to feel bad about ourselves, right? And so, you know, it's really the goal is, you know, for us to be able to accept and love ourselves unconditionally. And then also forgive ourselves. Um, you know, like I said, how much, how often should you forgive? I forgive um, every, actually I do about every two days. Um, I would like to do every day, but it just, you know, you do get busy. So the next um, answer I would like, you know, we're going to practice self-compassion. If everybody could put in the chat, what do you like about yourself? One thing, maybe it's about your physical appearance. A lot of people say, I like my eyebrows. I like my hair. I like my nails. Um, you know, I like my work ethic. I like my smile. I've even heard. I like my eyes. And I really love hearing, you know, these positive things that people can name about themselves, things that they like. So, um, you know, as you guys are putting that in the chat, I'm just going to go through the list here. So some ways that I practice self-compassion, like I said, is forgiveness. Um, I forgive myself and I forgive others. So if you live in a house with people, um, anybody, or maybe with cats, cats are, are a little temperamental, um, it's important to learn how to forgive, right? Um, you know, because, um, you know, just, it's hard. You're taking all of these different personalities, cramming them into this house. And, um, you know, especially during times of COVID, you may not get, be getting out as much. You get on each other's nerves. Um, you know, you can become resentful really easily. So, you know, we actually have a ceremony, like I said, the stomp dance, where we go and we're encouraged to forgive during that time. But you don't have to go to ceremony to do that. Like I said, I do this every couple of days. I'll forgive myself. Maybe I said the wrong word during a presentation. Maybe I didn't get um, my report done on time, whatever it was. Um, you know, maybe I forgot something. I forgive myself you know what, I am doing the best that I can. I am trying really hard. Um, and so I, I think it's important to cut ourselves some slack. You guys are doing amazing. You are taking on these huge roles, right? You know, as foster um, families, and that's a big deal. And so if you're having a, a tough day where you don't feel well, you need to cut yourself a break. Um, you know, because I feel like society as a whole, is really, um, has really unrealistic expectations for us. Um, you know, like I said, you know, we're supposed to get up, do all of these things. We're supposed to see our coworkers more than we see our family. Um, we're supposed to help our kids do homework for four hours sometimes after they're done with school. Um, we're supposed to keep our yards mowed just the right way or the HOA is going to come after you. We're expected to, you know, it just, it's really, I, I feel like it does not promote wellness, our schedules. And so if you're not feeling well, no wonder, right? So take some time, tell yourself you're amazing, at least every day, tell yourself you're beautiful, tell yourself that you love yourself, forgive yourself if you don't get some things done. You know, um, I, I feel like this is really important for us to be able to practice that self-compassion um, and model it. How you treat yourself is how your kids are going to treat themselves, right? You know, because our kids, they don't always do what we say, but they do what we do, right? And so this is one thing I learned the hard way because my son, he's um, 22 years old now, he has some of the same negative things that I practiced over the years which is um, he uh, is kind of hard on himself, um, you know, because I was in my youth and he, um, he doesn't like to kind of be shown new things. He likes to, oh, I, I got it, I got it. You know, he doesn't accept help very well. This is something how I was. And so, you know, our kids, they really will kind of model themselves after us. And now, so I have to go back, help my son do this work practice self-compassion, which is okay. We are both in therapy. I love, I'm a huge proponent of therapy, by the way. I, I love going to counseling. And so this is something we continue to work on, um, you know, to, and, and, that, and that's totally okay. Um, and so, like I said, forgive yourself, forgive others. I forgive my spouse every couple of days. I forgive her for turning the air conditioning off. And then I wake up so sweaty. I forgive her 
if she unintentionally hurts my feelings by not reacting to a movie or a meme the you know the way that I thought she was or you know by being maybe she's the grouchy because she had a rough day whatever it is I forgive her um, I used to keep a scorecard in my other relationships right you know and uh, you know that's just so unhealthy and so you know now I, I definitely practice that forgiveness on a regular basis um, I practice that self-compassion um, you know um, that self-acceptance by I do positive affirmations every time I wash my hands I say nice things about myself because I need to hear it I need to hear nice things every single day and I used to put that that was my spouse's job that was my parents job um, to make me feel good about myself and that's my kids' job to make me proud and it's not right that's really codependent and really unhealthy so now I have to take that that personal responsibility which is a native value as well and say, it is actually my job to make myself happy. It is my job to be my own cheerleader. It is my job to make myself feel loved, um, to feel um, um, handsome, to feel um, you know, like I'm worthy. So I, I say nice things to myself every day. I used to sit, pout, and I would stare at my spouse until she first recognized I was having a bad day. Second, she has to know exactly how to make me feel better. And she had to do all of this without me communicating with her at all. How unrealistic and unfair is that, right? And so now if I am having a bad day, I'll communicate it. Use my words, right? Hey, can we sit and talk? I don't feel very well. But if, you know, she's not around, I have to be okay with making myself feel better. So I say positive affirmations. Like I said, I do a lot of things um, kind of revolve around water for me. Um, and so every time I go, I wash my hands, right? Instead of singing happy birthday twice, I just tell uh, myself how handsome I am. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to go join any modeling competitions anytime soon, but I felt ugly for a lot of my life. And what a tragedy, um, you know, for a lot of us to go through life, not loving and accepting the way that we look or our personality or some of these things. I've been socially awkward my entire life. If you go to shake my hand, I'll go to high five you. And it's just, I've just been like that my entire life. I have so many awkward social interactions with waiters and waitresses and, and all kinds of stuff. And that used to really bug me. And now I just like, eh, I, I accept it. You know, it's just a part of me. It's a quirk. And I think it's funny. And so, and but positive affirmations have really helped me to accept all of those things about myself, and they also help me with my anxiety because some of my affirmations, I will tell myself I can handle anything life brings me today. I will tell myself that I am worthy. I will tell myself I am loved, that I'm loving. Um, I will tell myself that everything happens for my highest good. That is a huge one for me because I used to get caught up in, oh, this thing didn't work out how I supposed to. And then come to find out later, things actually unfold as they should everything works out fine. I always get everything taken care of. So why get myself all tied up in knots about it, right? So these are some ways that I practice um, self-compassion. Um, so let's see, let me see really quick. Um, so John says he thinks he has a good sense of humor. That is awesome, John. That is a great coping skill. Natives actually um, practice that coping skill forever. We really value uh, laughter and sense of humor. So that is awesome. Kristen says, I like how I interact with the young people who work with me. What a great skill, Kristen. And that's really awesome um, thing to, to like about yourself. Um, S. Fisher says, I like how open I am to new ideas and learning. That is a big one. Uh, you know, I used to, you know, think that I knew everything right in my youth. And now I know I on, only know a little and I get to keep learning for the rest of my life, which is awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Sue says, I love that I enjoy helping others. That is really great, Sue. Thank you for sharing that. And Jessica says, I love my ability to speak my language. Um, and Simon loves his work ethic. Those are two really great things. Thank you guys so much for sharing that. And so we're doing it. We're practicing self-compassion. And that's the goal for us every day. And it literally takes a couple minutes. So 
I practice this entire program in less than an hour a day. And that includes my 30 minutes of daily exercise. So, you know, a lot of these little things, you know, positive affirmations, doing a what went well list at night. Uh, when I'm brushing my teeth, I just start listing what went well. Um, I used to be, like I said, focused on the report that didn't get done, focused on the appointment I missed, focused on, you know, everything I did bad. I don't care about that. I'm about to go to bed. Let me take a look at what I, I did well today. Let me take a look at what went well around me. Maybe my sister helped out my brother. That was super awesome. So just listing all of these things puts me in a really great frame of mind to get rest. Um, that's actually one of my positive affirmations as well. I enjoy peaceful, restful sleep. I tell myself that. And so, um, you know, when I first started doing these, they took about a month, you know, because I didn't believe any of them. But I was determined to change the way that I viewed myself and how I felt about myself. And then one day I was just like, I don't know. I just felt kind of different. I was like, I'm pretty awesome, you know? And I just love that. Of course, I have bad moments, bad mornings, but, you know, on the whole now, I feel so much better practicing these things. So next we're going to talk about self-care. Um, I won't go too much into self-care because I think we're all pretty familiar with it. But Cherokee people have always, um, you know, really placed the responsibility for how we feel on ourselves. It is not, you know, now you go to the doctor and doctor's like, oh, he'll treat your symptoms, right? You know, a lot of times, here's some ibuprofen, here's some antibiotics, get them off us. You know, um, but when traditionally, when native people would go to a healer, they would sit them down and ask them a whole host of questions. Um, what have your thoughts been like? Um, what have your feelings been like? What are your relationships like? Because we've understood that all of these things can, you know, manifest themselves in physical symptoms, right? And so how we take care of ourselves, it's our responsibility, uh, which is great because we get to determine, determine how we feel, but it's also a little rough because we determine how we feel, right? So if we don't do a good job, we're not going to feel very well. And so, you know, and self-care looks different to everybody, right? So what we aspire to is we aspire to practice self-care regularly despite our busy, our busy schedule. So, and, you know, of course, self-care just means that. What do you do to make yourself feel better? Um, so here's how I do it. So, um, I do. These are some of the things I do for self-care. Like I said, none of these lists are all encompassing, you know, for how I do any particular practice, any particular um, component. But I would like to know from you if you could bring, put it in the chat. We talk about self-care, right? So that means, you know, what do we do to recharge our batteries, to bring our anxiety level down, our stress level down? What do you enjoy doing? So if everybody could put that into it to the chat, what brings you enjoyment? Maybe it's leaving work early, going watch a movie by yourself. Maybe it's going to get your nails done, going to get your hair done. Maybe it's lifting weights. Um, you know, what is that thing you enjoy doing? And what is that thing you need to do more to feel better? So how I practice self-care, I do my gratitude exercises every single day when I'm in the shower. I do my positive affirmations every single day when I'm washing my hands. I follow through with my doctor's appointments now. That's a part of my self-care. I used to skip those. Um, I make sure I get eight hours of sleep now. Um, you know, if the dog wakes me up and I get five hours of sleep, I would still roll into work. Now I don't. I call into work and I'm like, you know, um, I will be in later, you know, um, but I'm going to get my eight hours of sleep. And of course, I don't always get it. But for the most part, I do. Um, my anxiety is just kind of. Um, you know, it really gets raised if I don't sleep well. So it's really important for me to get that eight hours. Um, I started saying no for my self-care. I've been a people pleaser all my life. That's kind of the role I took on in, in our family, right? To maintain, try to maintain some, some semblance of balance. Um, and so, you know, being a people pleaser, one of the side effects of that or consequences is you're always exhausted because you put everybody else before yourself. 
And so now I started saying no, you know, and I always would look at people who could say no easily. And I'm like, that's so crazy. How do they do that? Um, you know, I always thought you would have to make up a lie, right? Like I need a really good excuse to get out of going to my coworkers, um, niece's birthday party. Right. And I'd be like, well, you know, um, uh, my cat is just having a hard time. And, you know, I'd just this whole thing, I would make up this huge story, you know, just because I'm exhausted and no, I don't want to go to your niece's birthday party. So now I just say, Hey, you know what? I'm sorry. I can't make it, but I hope you guys have a great time. So easy, right? I didn't, I never realized it was that easy, but having those boundaries for myself, you know, is, is a huge part of my self-care. Now I eat healthy for my self-care, but I also eat some junk food for my self-care. So during the week, I'm like focused on healthy eating, right? Uh, my spouse and I were really big on it, but you also, I also need those times where I sleep in, I stay in my pajamas. I'm going to watch some TV. I'm going to eat some comfort food. I'm going to kind of disconnect and, and recharge. I have those times too. Um, doing my exercise, my 30 minutes a day, that's what's recommended for my age group. And then the last thing, do things just for fun. I feel like during the pandemic, we kind of started to slack on, on our enjoyment. So what brings you enjoyment? What helps you maybe um, recharge your battery? So um, Kristen says, taking a walk. That is a great one. I love that. Taking a walk for self-care. Um, that is really awesome. Um, John says, practicing solitude and silence. That is, that, that is really great. Thank you, John, for sharing that. Jessica says, I like to color and Simon likes to fish. Those are really awesome. Um, I like doing both of those as well. And then Sue says, I like to paint or color by numbers. I'm not an artist. So the number art makes me feel good. That is great, Sue. What a great way um, to, you know, kind of enjoy yourself, to practice that self-care. You know, I always thought that you had to be good at something to do it, but you don't. I can be terrible at art, you know, but if it makes you feel good, if you enjoy it, more power to you. So um, that is so awesome. Thanks, you guys, for sharing. I really appreciate that. So you know, one of the biggest ways that I practice self-care, I put myself first. I come before my spouse. What I need comes before what my kid needs. Um, what I need comes before what everybody needs, right? It's the same thing. We've heard it a ton of times. You know, the masks come down in the plane, you put yours on first, right? Because if I'm passed out, I'm no good to anybody. And that's it's the same thinking when it comes to self-care. Um, so I schedule my self-care activities, whether it's counseling appointments, whether it's my physical fitness, whether it's, um, you know, playing golf to enjoy myself, you know, just these, I'm not asking for a lot. I'm just asking for some time to practice my self-care. And if those things are scheduled on my calendar and, um, you know, my, uh, you know, brother's like, hey, can you help me move? I'm like, ah, you know, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, I can help you tomorrow, though. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, my son comes down, he's like, hey, um, can you help me, um, you know, buy these things um, for my project tomorrow? I know it's um, 10 o'clock at night, and I know I need it at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, used to, I would jump up and do that. Now I don't, you know, um, I put myself first, and I'm like, hey, you know, that's on you, buddy. You know, everybody knows, you know, to be respectful. Give me some time. I will help you out with whatever you need. But, uh, you know, it's really important for me to take care of my mental health, my physical health, my emotional health. And then I actually have more patience for everybody else. I have more patience to watch that same YouTube video my son has shown me 30 times before. But I sit there and I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to spend that time. Why? Because I feel good. So um, it's no, it's not rocket science, right? The better we feel, the, the more energy we have for everybody else. Um, sobriety, you know, this is a big one. Um, I really feel like um, one that we should really um, promote more in, in Native culture. Um, we aspire to practice sobriety in order to live a vibrant and fulfilling life. 
So, um, you know, some of the ways, you know, if you know anybody who is struggling with sobriety, one thing I definitely encourage um, that I feel like is not, is not utilized enough, and that is asking for help. In Native culture, we've always believed in asking for help. You know, I don't know why um, a lot of Americans really have hold on to that notion of rugged individualism, right? I, I, like, I'm an island. I'm going to do it all by myself. That's just it's really unhealthy, right? And so, you know, I really, you know, I tell everybody, ask for help, ask for help, ask for help. Whatever you need help with, um, I have rarely found, you know, where I couldn't, you know, people weren't, you know, just, um, you know, really, really willing to to jump in and help me out with anything I've ever needed. So, um, practicing active sobriety means asking for help, identifying our triggers, um, having a list of positive ways to cope with stress and anxiety, um, practicing our walking in balance and healthy living and avoiding those people or situations that trigger us to use. So um, if everybody could put into the chat, what helps you cope? If you're having a bad day, what is your go-to thing kind of to help you cope with um, whatever you're dealing with? Some people say music. Uh, I hear that one a lot. Um, some people say taking a walk, uh, maybe talking to your spouse. Um, what, what helps you cope, um, you know, with, with, with whatever situation? So I, I do all of those. I really like talking. Um, I used to hold things in, bottle things up. Um, now I try to get them out. So whether it's journaling or talking about it, um, I really like to share those things. So um, let me check the chat really quick. Kristen says prayer. That is awesome, Kristen. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that is a really great positive way to cope. Um, Sue says read. Um, that is a great way also to just practice mindfulness to slow down. So that is so great. Um, John says going for a walk around the neighborhood. You know what? That helps me kind of cope and process so much whenever I go out, uh, you know, uh, whatever I'm going through at the end of my walk, I always feel so much better. So thank you so much for sharing that also, John. Um, let me see. Um, Jessica says, we gather the kids and pray together. That is great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jessica. I really appreciate that. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is wellness. This is a really big topic, but I really feel like you guys, I'm sure you understand um, wellness is kind of a universal concept now. Um, so we talk about the five components of wellness, spiritual wellness, mental wellness, physical wellness, emotional wellness, and social wellness, right? So, you know, this was actually our lifelong ambition in Cherokee culture was to live a life of wellness. It wasn't um, wealth. It wasn't power. It wasn't land. Our, our lifelong ambition as Cherokee people was to live a life of wellness. And so, you know, this is what I try to teach the youth now that our goal should be, because if you're well, everything else is going to come, you know, um, your grades, you know, um, the promotions, your relationships, every, all of that stuff will come if you're able to live a life of wellness. So, you know, but it's not any one, you know, area of wellness that accomplishes, you know, the job. It's us balancing all of these components together. So social wellness, this means we have healthy and positive connections with the people in your life. So if everybody could put into the chat, who is someone that supports you? Who is someone that you know, like um, you can call or somebody got your back and, and they're always supportive? Um, I would really like to hear that. So traditionally, Cherokee people, you know, uh, we have, you know, really unique family and social sit, um, systems that were practical and served a purpose. And like our family, our friendship should be rooted in mutual respect and provide support and help us to cope with life's changes. So who is someone that supports you? Kristen says her sister, um, that is awesome. Um, siblings are, are so great for that a lot of times. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that. Jessica says her best friend, that is great. John says his church community, that is awesome. And Sue says both of her older sisters. 
So um, I'm really happy to hear that you guys have supportive people in your life. Um, and as Fisher says, um, their parents. Um, that is really awesome. I'm really happy for you guys. So, so you guys get it, right? So, um, you know, the idea of social wellness is just have people in your life who are supportive. If they're not supportive, you got to have, you know, those healthy emotional boundaries and limit the amount of time you spend with them. I know with family, you can't just cut them off a lot of times, you know, you're going to see them no matter what, maybe, but just limit the, the time that you're spending with um, people who are may, um, maybe aren't ready to walk that healthy road with you. Mental wellness. So um, Cherokee people have always been able to cope with stress um, because we've long recognized the importance of being mentally well. Um, I practice this through by, you know, positive thinking. I also, like I said, I go to therapy, I go to counseling. Um, so, you know, one of the things that really helps me with my mental wellness also is to ask for help when I'm struggling. So if everybody could put in the chat, is it difficult for you to ask for help when you are struggling? Uh, you know, and if, if it is, it's not a big deal. These are all things we get to continue to work on. So um, none of them are set in stone. They're really fluid. So, and no judgment here. So, you know, like I said, I do this curriculum because I'm not good at these things. I don't do this curriculum because I am good. I love these reminders. I have to just practice this. It helps me to feel good. Um, you know, so don't think that you have to be perfect or anything like that, you know, um, you know, along this journey. So, you know, despite any adversity Cherokee people have faced, we were, we were able to remain productive and contribute in a positive way because of the pr protective factors that our cultural teachings provided. Like I said, they really promote well, mental wellness, promote positive thinking, um, you know, our, our teachings do. So um, let me see. So yeah, Jessica says yes. Michelle um, says yes, it, it is difficult. Um, S. Fisher, um, Sue, Kristen, um, Jamie, and John. So I will say to you, all of you who have said yes, that is difficult. You're in the right club. You know, this is me too. So, you know, um, but that's not a native um, really um, value. So, you know, um, do not be ashamed. Um, and, um, you know, if for, you know, if you need to ask for help, like I said, it really, I want to get back, get us back to that native value where it takes a village, right? It takes a community. Um, uh, you know, that's why we each have different skills. I have what I'm good at. My siblings have what they're good at. My coworkers have what they're good at. And we all get to communally add to society and bring each of our different talents, right? And so now that I recognize that, hey, maybe I'm not so great at this thing, I'll go ahead and ask for help with it. And so, um, yeah, but don't, don't feel bad. It is a challenging thing. It, it's hard for me also, but um, you know, I would just say that you deserve it. You guys are doing awesome, amazing things. You deserve help anytime you need it. So um, definitely make sure um, to reach out. Like I said, positive thinking, uh, this has really, really um, helped, helped me a lot in my life, and it's really promoted in Cherokee culture. So a long time ago, negative, negative, negative thoughts were treated with the same importance as wounds or physical illness by Cherokee healers because they understood that unchecked negative thinking can manifest, manifest itself um, in our lives. I have heard positive thinking described as being of good mind. And it has definitely had a profound impact on my life. So, you know, like I said, you know, I know positive thinking isn't the same, you know, isn't the answer to a lot of complex, um, you know, uh, mental issues, right? But by practicing positive thinking, it may actually help you ask for help or may help you get the help that you need a lot quicker. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, my aunt actually has a saying, she would say every day is a good day. And so, uh, you know, being able to check your negative thoughts, catch your negative thoughts and change them to positive ones 
I, I think it's a really great coping skill. So would each of you, um, if you could put in the chat, would you say your thinking is more positive or negative? Is this something you continue to work on? And like I said, no judgment with any of the answers here. So I would say I'm about, you know, on a scale of one to 10, about a seven, you know, uh, but I used to be a one. My ne my thinking was all, always negative. Um, and that had to do with my trauma. And, you know, I felt like I was, you know, really hyper vigilant, always prepared for the worst case scenario in case I got to break out of there or do something crazy, you know. Um, but now I, I manifest these positive things in my life because um, I think positively. And so I um, actually train my thinking now to, to be more positive, uh, you know, and it really, it's important because you have so many little moments throughout the day, right? So if I spill my coffee, I can be like, oh, great. It's going to be one of those days, you know, uh, my day's shot now. Or I can be like, oh, I spilled my coffee. Ah, that's no big deal. Let me get this cleaned up and uh, get back on the road. See how, you know, if you react positively to each of these little things that happen throughout the day, it lowers our stress, lowers our anxiety, and helps us to enjoy the, our day a lot more. So, but like I said, I still, I have to catch those thoughts because a lot of times my initial reaction is negative, um, but I get to, to stop it. I get to, to change it. And so that's the really awesome thing. Um, you know, about the walking and balance program, we get to work on these things. So um, let me check the chat here really quick. And um, Sue says hers is about 50 50. I feel you, Sue. Um, John says he thinks his is a little more negative. Um, it can be pretty critical. Um, and so he was just talking to a friend about that this morning. Um, that's awesome. Th those are great things to talk about. We don't talk about this stuff enough. Um, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. And Kristen says um, her thinking is more positive. When negative, I force myself to change the direction of my thoughts. Of course, yes, you're right. Sometimes it's easier than others. But that's the goal right there, right? Don't judge yourself if you have the initial negative reaction. Uh, you know, we get to catch it. We can catch those thoughts. And then we can change them to positive thoughts that... Uh, just really help us to not be so reactionary, right? To help us to, because really everything always works out, right? I mean, you guys are still here, you know, you're making it through a pandemic. You've made it through every difficult situation you've ever encountered. Everything always kind of works out, right? Maybe you're a little uncomfortable for a while, you know, but, um, you know, our worst case scenario, you know, for me at least, it never really comes to fruition. All my, that anxiety does is just make me have a horrible time of it, you know, through the process. So, um, and then S. Fisher says, I try my best to stay positive, but some days are rougher than others. And I totally feel you, you feel you guys. And you know what this makes you, all of this, you know, talking about negative thinking, this makes you human, you know? Um, so, you know, like I said, you are in good company here. We are all you know, like I said, our society is not built for wellness. It doesn't promote, uh, you know, a good mindset. It doesn't promote positive thinking. So we have to create these spaces for ourselves a lot of times, and which is okay. That's what we're here to do. So thank you guys so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. Physical wellness, um, you know, physical wellness, we actually have ceremonies about our physical wellness. We play a game called stickball that is super physical, um, super tough. Um, we actually do that before our ceremony. That's how high of an importance we place on physical wellness because we understand the importance of it. And we've seen during the pandemic also, right? Um, you know, the, the importance of being physically well. So if you could put in the chat, what is your favorite way to practice physical wellness? My favorite way now um, is walking. I love walking. I love yoga. Um, I can't run so much now. My knees are kind of, you know, um, things are starting to make noises. My joints starting to pop and this and that, you know, but I still want to be active, right? And so I really love walking um, as a way to, to practice physical wellness. Um, let me see. So um, S. Fisher says, um, working out. Um, that is awesome. You know, and that's a great way to 
kind of relieve stress and, and really help us to process some things, right? Also, Kristen says walking also, that is awesome. John says punching the heavy bag um, when he gets his motivation. That is really great. Um, I used to do that actually a lot too. That is super awesome. And Sue says riding her bike. So that is super cool. So, um, and then Jessica says, we both go for a walk together. We kill two birds with one stone. We talk about us. That is so great. Um, that is awesome, you guys. So now that you guys know what you like to do, we just got to find time to do it a little more, right? But our health has to take precedent over everything else because the better we feel, the, the, the more you know energy we're going to have for everybody else. And plus, it just helps us to enjoy life. Uh, you know, our quality of life is better. So emotional wellness. So like I said, you know, a long time ago, our healers would treat our whole self. And this included our emotional wellness. Um, you know, so when we talk about emotional wellness, it's really a broad topic. But what we're talking about is the uh, one's ability to recognize, accept, and express their emotions and feelings. Um, so if you guys could put it in the chat, do you find it difficult to recognize, accept, and express your emotions? So a long time ago, um, natives, we were actually a lot better at this. Talking about our emotions was highly promoted um, and is actually incorporated into our ceremonies. Now we are taught that men aren't supposed to talk, right? Um, women are supposed to be tough, right? You know, um, you know, you're not supposed to cry. And um, that's really toxic and really unhealthy, right? And so, you know, I tell a story a lot about how almost every house I've ever moved into, you can see where people have popped where um, they have punched holes in walls probably, and they've been patched over. It's more acceptable for people to express anger than to express sadness, to express grief. But we have, there's such a, a wide spectrum of emotions, right? But I feel like anger is more, is more easily accepted a lot of times. So, um, you know, I would hope that, you know, we try to promote you know, us being able to accept our emotions, um, whatever they may be, because we have them for a reason, right? They're natural. So um, let me see. Um, Kristen says, yes, it's hard to express. I recognize them, just don't always they express them. Um, that's totally okay, Kristen. You know, one thing we tell people is to keep a journal. It, you know, that's another great way to express your emotions. Um, Jessica says, yes, afraid to be judged. I hear you um, on that one. Um, John says, yes, as well. And Sue says, not always, but I'm working on it daily. So um, I feel you guys, it is, um, you know, kind of, like I said, it's not promoted in our society. So we really have to take this upon ourselves. Um, but, uh, you know, if we can, you know, learn to recognize, accept, and our express our emotions and feelings, we're going to be in such a better place emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and our kids are watching us, right? So we, we set that positive example to let them know that it's okay to, to express their emotions. So Michelle says, can recognize and accept, but not always express. I, I, I totally feel you. You know, whenever you go up to a coworker or a friend, um, what's the first thing they say? How's it going? And you're supposed to say fine, right? You have to say fine. Um, you know, or you say it's going, but um, if you say anything other than that, it makes it really awkward, right? But what if you just said, hey, you know what? Actually, I'm glad you asked because I'm kind of sad today. Do you have a couple minutes to sit down and talk about it? What would your coworker's face look like, right? But why even ask? Why do you even ask me the question if you don't want me to be real? And so that's really what the goal is for us now. Let's be real. Let's be real in our relationships. Let's be real. Let's put it out there. Let's tell it how it is. Um, you know, and so I, I feel like this is a lot healthier um, and not just negative emotions, but positive emotions as well. Um, I tell my kids I love them to the point of making them uncomfortable, but I don't care. You know, um, I grew up and I had to guess how my family felt about me. 
because we didn't say it. It wasn't promoted. And so, you know, because my family had a lot of trauma to deal with. My grandparents were placed in Indian boarding schools and they were severely beaten um, for speaking their language. And they passed down that trauma to my parents um, who were um, actually coped with drugs and alcohol. We had a lot of chaos. They passed that down to me. And now I have the opportunity to break that cycle. But um, like I said, this is kind of a, you know, an American thing, right? Um, but it's not healthy and it's hurting us. So if you feel like having a cry, have a cry. If you feel like talking about your feelings, talk about your feelings. And if you feel judged, one thing I, um, you know, encourage is go to counseling. I love going to counseling because this person does not know me, does not family, um, doesn't know my family. I don't care if they judge me. So I go in there and I talk about whatever I need. If I need to cry, if I need to be angry, if I need to process grief, if I need to work through some sadness. Um, and then at the end, just like getting a lollipop, they give me some positive coping skills to help me work through some of this stuff. What an awesome thing, right? And so I'm a big proponent of, um, you know, emotional wellness. And so, uh, but, you know, like I said, it's a process, guys. You know, that's why we're here talking about it. And thank you guys so much for um, taking that healthy risk um, to share today. I really appreciate it. Um, then the last one is spiritual wellness. You know, a lot of, from a lot of my life, I thought spiritual wellness was religion. It was just my relationship with the creator, but it really also encompasses my relationship with my own spirit. If I'm quiet, you know, and if I'm in a good um, space, my spirit will actually talk to me. Um, I've, I'm in Oklahoma right now. Actually, this is a part of my spiritual calling. I was working in California, having a great life, great time of it, loved my job. And I would feel this calling to come back to Oklahoma. Where I live and work, uh, my hometown has the lowest life expectancy in the United States. I think it's 54 years old. And that really bothered me. When I would see, I would work with these, these um, young kids, I would, in the back of my mind, would be called back home. I was being called back here. That was my spirit calling. That was my spiritual calling. So if we are able to meditate and be quiet in some of our spaces, no matter where they are, um, where you go for spiritual wellness. Like I said, I'm even connected to my spirit and the creator when I go outside in nature. Just that connection really promotes my spiritual wellness and helps me to be quiet. And like I said, if, you, if you're quiet enough, your spirit will talk to you to help you find that, that purpose for you in life. And so you guys are all doing these really amazing things, taking on these really challenging roles. And so, um, you know, you may have had that spiritual calling already. Um, but um, spiritual wellness is definitely another thing uh, that is really important. So with all of that huge thing, we're talking about wellness, right? This is kind of how I practice it. I set an intention daily. Every day um, when I get up, I get to de determine what kind of day I'm going to have. I get to de determine how I'm going to feel. So I set that intention daily. Um, I keep a journal for mental wellness. Uh, do my positive affirmations, practice mindfulness, um, eat healthy, get eight hours of sleep. Um, all of these things really help me to practice wellness. Um, so I'm going to, um, we, if we could just take a short um, break, and then we're just going to finish the last of this. Um, so I'm just going to take a really quick break, get some water. I'm going to stop my share. Um, Rose, I don't know if you want to stop the recording, um, but if we could just give everybody a really quick break and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up um, and go ahead and get out of here. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen really quick. And um, like I said, I'm just going to step out really quick, get some water, um, walk around my office a little bit, and then we will finish up. So, uh, so thank you guys um, for taking a quick break with me. That is actually me practicing my self-care. Um, I can only talk for so long before, uh, you know, I just need to shake it out a little bit. But um, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate that. So um, we're going to continue 
talking about um, wellness. Like I said, we were talking about, you know, all of these are just some of the ways that I practice my wellness. So the next one we're going to talk about is communication. You know, um, we aspire to communicate effectively and practice active listening. So, you know, Cherokee people, you know, if you hear them talk, the elders, they talk really slow, really deliberate. They uh, don't talk over each other. And they always, there's a pause. You know, when one person stops talking, the other person will have that pause there before they start talking. And I feel really feel like that's a great way to communicate. And so, um, you know, it's been pointed out to me by my spouse, actually, that I have a tendency to talk over her when I'm excited. So this is something I continue to work on myself um, because I've had anxiety. You know, my whole life is something I've struggled with. I, um, you know, would communicate really fast and I kind of take shallow breaths. So now... I just take my time and recognize communication. It's not a contest and, um, you know, make sure that I am practice active listening as well. So, you know, effective communication, just this just means that the message we're trying to convey is understood and we under, understand what people are trying to communicate to us. And so, you know, but we have to um, take into account also that you know, everything we hear gets filtered, right? Through our experiences, through our trauma, through everything. And I often tell a story about this. Um, my spouse and I, we've been together five years now. And the first day we actually, after a year, we, we decided to move in together. Um, that first day we moved in together, we actually um, were on the verge of breaking up. I actually moved back out. And it was due to miscommunication. So I have two dogs. I have a, a mean one, Chihuahua, um, named Yin Yin, and I have a nice one named Angel. She's a terrier. And so my ex-wife really didn't care for my dogs. I don't know how I ended up with them. They weren't even my dogs. I got them as presents for my kids, but somehow they became my responsibility anyway. So I was, um, we were moving in together and I was going to bring my dogs over. And she said, do your dogs have their shots? And so what she meant was, hey, I know you're working today. So if they don't have their shots, I want, I'll go ahead and take them for you. And, um, you know, so you don't have to worry about that. That's what she meant. What's her question? What I heard was, oh my God, I can't believe I have to live with these dogs. Um, you know, they're so dirty, probably. Do they even have their shots? And I got my feelings hurt. And I said, you know what? Hey, if you guys, if you, if it's too much for you, if you don't want us, you know, moving in, because I moved into her place and I already was kind of on edge about that, right? You know, moving in with somebody else, there's a lot of feelings and emotions there. You're taking a big risk, right? Um, so I was kind of really raw, you know, with my emotions. And I was like, you know what? That's okay. That's fine. And we, we almost split up over that one question. And so now I recognize I have past trauma, past experience, past relationships, right? And so I make sure to clarify. When she says something to me and it hurts my feelings, I will clarify with her to see what she meant before I just go and take that leap that you know, assume automatically that she's, you know, trying to say something mean, right? So um, it's just funny, though, you know, how often, you know, we can, we think communication should be really easy, right? I say one thing, you, you understand that thing. But, uh, you know, it's really quite nuanced. And so, uh, you know, I just think it's funny how we can easily have these mis miscommunications. And also in Native culture, sometimes, you know, your face doesn't really say the same things your words are saying, you know, so that's another thing we maybe need to be, um, you know, aware of. And then communicating over social media, it, you don't really, it's not, you, you may be making a joke, um, but, uh, you know, if you say, you have to put that LOL on there, you know, sometimes so people get that, right? So um, communicating feelings and emotions, we talked about this, extremely important if we can communicate, uh, it's so healthy. 
um, and will really help us to process those feelings and emotions a lot quicker. So when we talk about um, communication, this is what we're talking about. Communicate honestly, communicate your feelings and emotions, take your time when communicating, avoid those assumptions, and avoid blame in conversations. Um, you know, this is really uh, in native culture and Cherokee culture, this is what we mean when we talk about it, communicating effectively. And then the last being, you know, being an active listener. And then of course, refrain from gossip. Uh, you know, this really can uh, make our homes and our workplaces out of balance, you know, if we are engaging in gossip. So um, what communication skill would you like to work on? Um, if people don't mind throwing that into the chat, um, I would really appreciate it. So as we wait for your guys' answer, we're going to talk about respect. So, you know, we aspire to always show respect to ourselves, others, and the environment. Um, too many people overvalue what they are not and undervalue what they are. You know, I feel like we're taught to respect others. I feel like a lot of times we're really good at that, but maybe not so much at, as respecting ourselves. So how do we respect ourselves? You know, first, I think it's important to determine what your values are. So much of our self-respect comes from our values. And if we are able to act within our values, I don't know about you, but we don't have a family crest up on our wall with all of our values listed, but that might be a great idea, you know? And so since I didn't know what my values were, it really helped me to first write them down. And that way I knew if I was acting within my values. Um, and then changing negative thoughts. Um, you know, this is a great one. Like I said, catching those negative thoughts, changing them to positive ones is, is really helpful. Spend time with the respectful people. Um, you know, they say that um, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, you know, I, uh, but it's definitely a drag. If you sp hang out with people who are disrespectful, always negative, Make sure, you know, if you can limit your time you, you spend with those people. And then the last one, treat others how they want to be treated. This just takes just a little more effort and a little more time. You know, I know that we were raised with the saying, treat people how we want to be treated, but we're all different, right? And so once I learn how people want to be treated, it's no problem to treat them accordingly. Um, that promotes balance as well. And then last, treat animals and the environment with respect. Um, so the next one we're going to talk about is perseverance. So, you know, if you have two brothers, right, we think about raised in similar um, situations. One is really successful, has a good life. The other one is suffering from, uh, you know, a lot of things and may live under a bridge, may suffer from substance abuse. What causes that? You know, I feel like a big part of that is how we talk to ourselves about any given situation. Our self-talk is really, um, really helps us to cope with these situations. So, um, you know, and in Cherokee culture, this has been hugely important because we have faced so much adversity. Uh, in my aunt, like I said, she was the chief of our tribe and she said, the secret of our success is that we never, never give up. And so, you know, don't be afraid of failure. Um, I, I think that's, that's very important also. So how do we practice perseverance? So, you know, it's first, you know, be clear about our motivation. You know, when we have our tough times, this really helps us to remember why we are doing something. You guys have taken on these really huge roles, these really difficult roles. And so, you know, um, being clear about why we got into this in the first place will really help if you do have some adversity. Um, make sure our goals are measurable and attainable, um, you know, and then break those goals down into manageable steps. And then, like I said, expect some adversity along the way. We're not going to manifest it, but if we have some adversity, just don't let that surprise us, right? And then look at any challenges as opportunities to grow. And then the last one, you know, we talked about us not being good at, but will really help us to persevere ask for help. No matter what it is, um, you know, don't worry about people judging you, put it out there, take that healthy risk and ask for help. And then, um, you know, of course, be your own cheerleader. This is 
hugely important. How you talk to yourself um, every day. Uh, you know, we have so many thoughts during the day. And if they're mostly negative, this can really, uh, you know, dim our chances at uh, achieving our goals. Uh, if we're talking to ourselves in a negative way, right out of the gate, right? So if we are being positive, um, practicing that positive self-talk, it really helps. Um, and then balance. So, you know, balancing all of these things, right? They talk about work-life balance. Um, you know, how I achieve that is I put myself first. I have to put what, what I put my needs first. And I'm not talking about, this doesn't take up a huge part of my day. This just makes sure that I'm maintaining my physical health, my mental health, my emotional health, so that I can then be a better spouse, be a better parent, be a better friend. So um, it's actually just really, really healthy. So how I practice balance, um, first define what balance means to you. Define what does fulfillment mean to you? This really helped me to kind of sculpt what I wanted my schedule then to look like. And schedule your wellness activities and protect that time. So like I said, if somebody is going to, you know, is asking something from you and you look on your calendar and you have a therapy appointment that time or a massage appointment or a hair appointment, don't put yourself and what you need, um, you know, don't put other people in front of that. Um, that can definitely throw you out of balance. If you, you know, aren't um, able to work out, you know, don't overcompensate the next day. That'll also throw you out of balance. Practicing self-compassion also will really help you to stay in balance. So um, being of service, we aspire to be of service to others whenever possible and help each other to walk in balance. So showing compassion towards others promotes connection and helps us to see things from others' per perspectives. Practicing compassion puts our empathy for others into motion and enables us to work for each other. The Cherokee word for this is gadugi, which means working together, and it is compassion put into action. So work for each other. If you can, you know, I know that we've often put just the chores on one person or two people, the parents, right? But make that chore chart. Get everybody involved. Let's spread some of this um, stuff around so that we're not overwhelmed. This actually promotes balance in our household. Um, you know, there's that saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? You know, but it's really um, just kind of, you know, unhealthy to put, you know, all of the expectations, you know, for something onto one or two people. So here's how I, you know, um, practice service. I just start my day by thinking of others, praying for people. That's a great way to be of service. Um, ask how you can help. Be, servant, be of service in your household. So if I can, I pick the chores that I kind of like doing. I like cleaning the bathrooms. I don't know why, just always liked it. Um, you know, I was in an Indian boarding school whenever I was young. And um, so I just got used to cleaning bathrooms. And so that's one chore I'll pick. Um, be of service in your community. Be of service in a way though that fits your lifestyle and don't overdo it. I think that's um, very important when we're talking about service. All right, guys, we made it to the last one. Sorry I have kept you so long. This actually went longer than I thought it was going to, um, you know, and so, but I appreciate you guys sticking with me through this process. The last one is just action. None of these teachings, you know, really mean anything if we don't put them into action. Practice your self-care, talk about your feelings, write in your journal, tell yourself you're amazing, get your hair done, go to the movies, you know, all of these things um, together really encompass, uh, you know, our, our, our balance and our health. So we aspire to accomplish our goals through action and personal responsibility. So we take, out, we take on that personal responsibility that I am in charge of my health. I am in charge of my happiness. I am in charge of my thoughts. And so with that, we get to determine what we think, how we feel, what we're going to do. And so, you know, um, because we're so often pulled in so many different directions, having an action plan 
really helps. And so um, this is how I put, you know, all of these actions into practice. I identify, hey, what are my goals? Like I said, every morning I get up, I set an intention for my day. You, you don't get to determine how I feel. So this means I, I usually pick three things. <sighs> so today I want to feel grateful. Today, I want to practice mindfulness. I want to be present for my family. Today, I want to have fun. So I'll pick those three things. And that means that no matter what occurs that day, that is, that is my plan for the day. And that is what I'm going to do. So if somebody cuts me off and flips me off in traffic, I don't care. I'm still going to be grateful. Um, if somebody needs me to do something at work, oh, actually, I already took off. I'm using this PTO. I'm going to the movies with, with my spouse. You know, so, so putting ourselves first, setting in that intention for the day really helps me. Like I said, and then once you make an action plan, you know, make sure it's realistic um, so that you can stick to it. And we, we period, periodically are going to have to evaluate these action plans. And then the last one, have a plan for emergencies. Um, so if you guys could put into the chat, what is one action item from today's presentation you would like to put into practice? So maybe it's asking for help more. Maybe it is positive affirmations. Um, practice positive thinking. Um, putting yourself first. Um, doing a daily gratitude practice. Um, what is one um, thing that you would like to put into action? from today's presentation. Um, if you guys could um, put that, you guys can actually put that into the chat. Um, but yeah, having a plan for emergencies is really important. Maybe some people to call. Um, part of my plan for emergencies, number one, take a walk. That so helps me to process. Um, you know, uh, I talk to my spouse, um, you know, if I'm having a hard time, um, you know, having, um, you know, some mental health resources is very um, helpful. And so just having that plan for maybe that day when things don't go right. So I'm going to look into the chat really quick um, before we get out of here. And so let me see. Um, so Rose says, oh, sorry. So Jamie says positive affirmations and working on daily gratitude. Those are two great ones. Those help me so much. Uh, you know, um, talking to yourself in your nice, in that nice way, telling yourself you're amazing, telling yourself you are awesome. We really need to hear that more. So that's awesome. Thank you so much, um, Jamie. Kristen says a daily gratitude practice. That is awesome. Yes, being grateful for everything that we're blessed with. S. Fisher says putting myself first. That is so hard to do. Um, and so if you struggle with that, don't worry about that at, at all, but that is such a great thing to put yourself first. You deserve it. And your family and everybody around you is really going to benefit from you feeling so much better. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, John says, I've been wanting to practice gratitude more regularly. So this has been a good reminder and encouragement to do that. That is great. Um, Sue said, putting myself first for once. That is so awesome. And Jessica says, identify our goals of our action plans. That is so great. Yes, give yourself direction. That way you know where you're headed. And then Michelle said, better communication. These are all amazing things, guys. You guys are so awesome. Um, like I said, you guys are doing amazing work. You are, you know, breaking cycles. You are working on yourselves. You are taking care of other people and you deserve a break. You deserve some kind words. You deserve a hot bath. You deserve to get your nails done. You deserve to communicate effectively, um, you know? And so I'm so proud to be a part of this journey with you. Um, like I said, I, I went a little over time that I intended to do, but I, I'm so grateful that you took this journey with me today. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you so much, Victoria, uh, for allowing me to be here today to present. And um, with that, um, I just um, 
going to be sending good thoughts your way as you continue to work on this stuff. And um, just thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it.